Welcome back guys, this is Derek Kirby with the Dallas Prospect and we have a surprising Mavericks victory perhaps to talk about here. Yesterday, I couldn't run the show last night after the game like I like to because I've been dealing uh, with my daughter and colic, which is fun for new parents. Uh, so that kind of wiped out last night's show, so I'm running it back today instead, but that's fine because I have a little bit more context now and a little bit more uh, interesting notes to add to the equation. So in this game, the Mavericks were without, we found out, Luka Doncic, Kristaps Porzingis, and Dorian Finney-Smith, aka the three guys that pretty much made the win most possible against the Bucks, the best win I think of the season. Not having them going against the Jazz really seemed to spell doom for any slim notion the Mavericks had about moving up in the Western Conference playoff standings because the Jazz had to lose the final three and the Mavericks had to basically win out. So slim, but not impossible. It seemed like you were waving the white flag on that front, so to speak, but really it didn't end up being a bad idea because even... Even going into the game, I kind of rationalized it, saying to myself, well, you know, one, three of your five games at that point had gone into overtime. All five of them had been within, I mean, the Clippers pulled away, but essentially four of the five of them had been decided by four points. So the idea of resting your guys one is smart because the odds are too slim to move up and it's more important to be at full strength. So I like that, especially with Luka having to play such heavy minutes in the five prior games. So you take that and you're like, all right, you rest Luka, certainly rest KP. Dodo's had a little bit of a hip strain. So, all right, fine, rest them, makes sense. But then I thought about it and I was like, you know, this kind of is genius because the team had really had its confidence, I think, shaken a little bit based on how the bubble play had gone for them, right? The huge, colossal collapse that cost them a phenomenal victory against the Rockets to open. Getting surprised by the Suns, who are now 6-0 after thumping OKC, who, in their own right, was resting a lot of their key players. But nevertheless, the Suns look like they're about to slip into the playoffs. Um, and so you drop those two. You do get your first win then against the Kings, but you have to scratch and claw and fight. And it's just this ugly, gunky mess of an offense before you finally pull it out in OT to get a slim victory against the Kings. So you win, and that's good, but it didn't feel like a real confidence builder for the team. Then you pivoted to the Clippers game. You played them tough for three and a half quarters, but in those final six minutes, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George pull away. The Mavericks hung tough, but ultimately looked to still be a tier behind the Clippers, who, to be fair, is the worst possible matchup for the Mavericks, I think. The Mavericks, even though the Bucks, for instance, have a better record and are a higher rated defense, the Mavericks give their defense more problems than they're able to give the Clippers defense. So it's not an ideal scenario there. But suddenly you're looking at this and you're saying, dude, we're one and three in the bubble. The one win was not a pretty win. We're kind of shook right now because now we got to go face up with the Bucks and the probably likely MVP again, Giannis Antetokounmpo. So with that in mind, when you get that victory against the Bucks, then the idea becomes, okay, well now that's a huge confidence builder. You answered the bell on your two biggest weaknesses this year, that being third quarter play and in the clutch. You answered both. You scored your best win of the season, Luka's best game probably of his NBA career to this point, and you got real confidence builder up and down the roster for the most part. There's a couple of points there, and we'll get into that. But you really found something, you think. Dorian Finney-Smith is playing great. Luka and KP are playing out of their minds. I think KP, he's not 30 points per game anymore, but he's like 29.4 points per game fantastic play from your main guys and you rest them but at this point the notion is all right well you're keeping them on that high confidence builder and giving them rest 
Now you're going to have a fresher, more confident, you know, core when the playoffs roll around. That's the belief. Because at this point, there's not really, I mean, they're not officially, officially locked into the seven, I don't believe. But it's pretty much all but done at this point. So with that in mind, you're like, all right, that makes a lot of sense. You keep the confidence high, coming off the best win that you can't really top the rest of the way. I mean, I guess you could have run off and somehow run the table through the rest of the regular season bubble play. But at that point, then you're losing the advantage of the rest element. So it made sense. I talked to myself into that. It made a lot of sense to rest those guys yesterday. So it seemed like you were waving the white flag against the Jazz, who, let's be honest, the Mavericks have lost 9 of 10 against the Jazz in the last couple years. Uh, the one exception, oddly, last year was a 50-point Mavericks blowout early in the season at the AAAC. Just interesting notion there. So the Mavericks, coming into this game, even though the Jazz said they weren't going to play Donovan Mitchell, you kind of thought, like, all right, well, you know, it's probably not looking good. But if you are trying to find something for the Mavericks, you're basically trying to get some of those guys up and down your roster, some of those role players, really specifically Tim Hardaway Jr. and Seth Curry. You want to get them going because they have been the most inconsistent players on the Mavericks, who the Mavericks need to play high, play like at a higher level, really a notch above their typical level. And that's, you know, typically the benefit of playing with a Luka and a KP is the, the vision of Luka to find them when they're open, getting them the ball when they've got like six plus feet of space sometimes for wide open looks. And with KP, the gravity, his presence presents as far as the opposing defense, capitalize on that. But they hadn't really done it. In the first game, uh, Hardaway Jr. went off for 24 points. Then you had in the... Curry did nothing in that game, that first game. Then you had the rest of the games kind of play out, and Curry had an okay game, but then he missed a couple games. And, you know, he was okay against the against the Bucks, but nothing to really write home about. Hardaway hit a couple big shots in the fourth quarter of that Bucks game, but he hadn't really found himself. And so you thought, all right, well, without Luka KP, not that Dorian's going to get a lot of shots, but without Luka and KP, and with Dorian absent, there's more minutes to be afforded in this case and a lot more scoring opportunities for the Mavericks. So you're thinking like, all right, well, this is where you kind of look to see if you can get a moral victory in this case. If you can get uh, a little bit of a rhythm going for those guys, you're gonna be good. Now the Jazz, while they did sit Donovan, they still played Gobert and Mike Conley Jr. Like they ran out their guys and this game kind of went interestingly in that regard. First of all, Tim Hardaway Jr., aggressive right from the jump, attacking the rim, slashing to the basket. I really dug it. Got himself a couple easy baskets early on. You really build on confidence on that. And let me look what ends up happening for him. 27 points to lead all scores, 11 of 15 from the field, three of six from three. That's pretty nice. That's pretty much exactly what you were hoping for for Tim Hardaway Jr. But then look at this. Curry, 22 points, 8 of 11 from the field, 4 of 6 from 3. And one of those two misses rimmed the basket. Like rim the rim the rim? Whatever. Rim the goal. Nearly dropped down, just kind of fell out. And as a result, you're like, oh, Damn, you've got both of your main guys humming offensively. That's excellent. But you found production otherwise down the roster. Boban, 20 points, 9 rebounds, 2 blocks. Going pretty much just stonewalling early on in the game in a nice block of Rudy Gobert. Now, Gobert only played 16 minutes. And it was the same for Conley. Like the Jazz, by no means am I saying the Jazz minus Donovan ran out their whole team and they were just content with going with like, hey, we're going for the win even though we don't have Donovan. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that they at least played some and early on in that first quarter, the Jazz went nuts from three-point uh, range. Eight threes, I believe, in the first quarter. And then in the third quarter, they had seven more. The Jazz hit 23s for the game, but it was the first and third quarters that did the damage. And as such, they built a pretty comfortable lead against the Mavericks. 22 points 
Like if you're if you were watching this game and you hung tight going into the fourth quarter, like through the whole game, kudos to you because the Mavs started their run in the third quarter, but they still went into the fourth quarter down, I think, 13 points or 12 points, down 12 points. And they open the fourth quarter by scoring the first 13 points. 13-0 run. And at that point, the Jazz, who had had great ball movement and spacing and was just finding open shooters that were just cooking from beyond the three-point line, it kind of started to fall away from them. Now, the Mavericks, conversely, an interesting point. Uh, this is like the fewest three-pointers the Mavericks have shot in a game since 2018. I want to say it was like 23 or 24. Let me see here. The Mavericks attempted 24 three-pointers for the game, shot 12 of 24. Meanwhile, the Jazz saw, shot 46 threes, 21 of 46 for 46%. So, excuse me, the Jazz knocked down 21 threes, even better than I said earlier. It's just a case where you had the Jazz cooking, 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 and then kind of stopped losing uh, the, the ball movement and the spacing, and they dropped off. And after that, the Mavericks were able to kind of claw back into it and then assert their will. I like as well, and I just miss putting him on the board here, even though I technically have room for him. Uh, Maxi with some big plays down the stretch. Swats a wing, slashing to the basket. The wing gets the mismatch on the perimeter and is like, oh, this is, a, this is a power forward slash center and Maxi Kleba. I'm just going to go right by him and get a nice bucket. Nope. Maxi swats it away, and then coming down the other end, you get a big three from Maxi as well. Just, just a big swing in that momentum in that regard. So with this, you have the Mavericks essentially pulling away, and you end up getting a 122-114 victory. Now, now you've won three of your six games in the bubble. While your first one wasn't anything to write home about, I think this is actually a very encouraging win. It's everything you could have asked because you got Curry and Hardaway cooking and efficient. And even a little more at that point. J.J. Barea dropping 18 points and 8 assists on 7 of 13 from the field. That's his highest scoring game since 2018 as well. So you're finding some things going here. And then to actually get more continued production from Trey Burke, who, by the way... We got to give a shout out to Trey Burke and the way he's playing in the bubble. Since the Mavericks brought him back, you know, we, we of course gawked over his 31 point explosion against the Rockets in the first game. And since then, we haven't really, you know, he hasn't exploded off the page, but for a bench player, he's been nice and consistent. He's been somewhere in like the 9 to 12 range. He gets 14 in this game coming off the bench. Uh, and how many minutes did he have here? He had 24 minutes. He goes 14 points, 4 assists, 5 of 10 from the field, 2 of 2 from 3, and 2 steals. That's another aspect that's been a pleasant surprise to me. He's not just a very good offensive fit for Rick Carlisle's system, which then makes you kind of question why the Mavericks didn't bring him back after acquiring him in the KP trade last year. But his energy on defense is helping this team. Speaking of energy on defense... We finally got a good look at MKG, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, and the dude posts an absurd stat line here. He only gets 18 minutes, six rebounds, some of which are very hard rebounds. How many points? Zero. How many assists? Zero. How many field goal attempts? Zero. How many three-point attempts? Zero. Free throws? Zero. Blocks? Zero. Steals? Zero. So you're wondering, well, why are you shouting this out? He just came in and got six rebounds, right? No, no, no. Granted, it's against reserves from Utah, but his defense in the second half helped the team turn the tide. He is a game high plus 21 in this game, despite attempting zero field goals. That's pretty impressive. MKG deserves more minutes. I understand why, you know, with us being such a offensively minded team, it might seem confusing and counterproductive to have a guy like MKG in there. But you know what? When you're doing that kind of work defensively and you're making an impact in the game, 
you got to find a role for that guy somewhere. And I do think you will start to see a little bit more from him here and there. Certainly in these last couple games, I don't expect the Mavericks to do much of anything because I think they're pretty much locked into where they are. They might get some light action here and there, but it's going to be kind of like you saw with what the Jazz did here where they get 16 minutes or so maybe out of Luka KP in one of these couple games to close out the regular season part of the bubble. And that's about it. You know, just something to kind of keep them a little bit in rhythm. And other than that, take it, take it off for the night. Now, speaking, as I mentioned, Mike Conley, my favorite play of the game, and maybe it should have been whistled as a foul. You had Boban on the perimeter pickpocketing Mike Conley, leading to a Mavericks fast break the other direction. Just incredible. Incredible to get that visual there. Seven foot three Boban picking the pocket of a, you know, I, I think uh, Conley, you know, he, he's not done as well in Utah as I would have expected. But you're talking about a guy that was one of the better point guards in the league just a couple years ago. And so to pull that off against him is pretty, pretty incredible, I think. But the Mavs in this game, you know, they show grit, they show hustle, and they got everything they could have possibly asked for and more. Let me see if there are any game notes here that I had that I wanted to shout out. Uh, let's see, let's see. This is the Mavericks' largest comeback. I know that. Let me find it here. The Mavericks' largest comeback since, I believe, a game against the... Yeah, that's Brea. Right here. 2016, but I wanted the team it was against. This is from Brad Townsend on Twitter. He says, Today's 22-point comeback was the Mavericks' largest since a win over Denver in February of 2016. Not anything to sneeze at. Barea, I said earlier, it was his highest scoring game since 2018. That is against New Orleans in December of 2018. That's from Mavs PR. Uh, this isn't even specifically about the game, but just shows you how KP has been playing in the bubble. In the regular season, prior to the bubble, he was averaging 19.2 points, 9.5 rebounds on 54% true shooting. He has elevated his play in the bubble to 29.4 points, 10.2 rebounds on 57.2% true shooting percentage. So, significant step up there. As for Seth Curry and him getting going, here's an interesting footnote as well from Mavs PR. In this game, Seth Curry attempted his 1,000th career three-point attempt in a game he made he has made 441 of them which gives him a 44.1 percent three-point percentage for his career that is second in nba history with a minimum of 250 attempts only behind steve kerr's 45.4 percent so through your first a thousand attempts he is the second most efficient three-point shooter in nba history by the way behind him is hubert davis Petrovic, and Duncan Robinson. So Steph isn't on that list in that regard. Just an interesting little jab there. Not, but you know, the joke is that like, oh, we have the best Curry. Obviously not, but uh, you know, worth noting, he's a marksman, and if you get him the opportunities, while he can be hot and cold in some games here, the mean tends to skew towards very efficient, which he got in this game as well, four of six. This was from Brad Townsend yesterday. This is after the game. He says, if the Mavericks lose either of their final two games, they will finish seventh. To overtake sixth place Utah, the Mavericks have to win remaining games versus Portland and Phoenix, and Utah must lose its remaining game versus San Antonio. To overtake number five OKC, which OKC got beat, so I think OKC might have actually dropped into the sixth spot there. I have to double check that, but I know with them being shorthanded against the Suns. The Suns beat up on them. To overtake number five, Mavs must win two games and OKC must lose to either Miami or, or I said, must lose to Miami and the Clippers, excuse me. So like I said, the Mavericks are pretty much dialed in where they are. And that's why I think this strategy of rest, largely rest your starters, you know, whether it's the entire game or just give them a little taste in maybe the first quarter, maybe the start of the second quarter, 
Other than that, I think you're very, very well off instead focusing on getting your bench guys going, trying to get your role players who have been so absent through much of the bubble play. If you get them cooking again, you can compete with anybody. You saw even in the game against the Bucks where Hardaway Jr. was still struggling. Yeah, Finney Smith stepped up and filled that number three role for the Mavericks in that game, but that's not going to be a consistent thing, even though he has also played very well in the bubble. Uh, you're, you got to find those role players stepping up. There's a reason Seth Curry and Tim Hardaway Jr. were two of my major Mavericks X-Factors for the remainder of the season. In the 21 games prior to the season suspending, Curry was shooting like 54% from three. Dude was cooking. Unfortunately, he hit a brick wall and then he got hurt. And now he's back and through two games, okay. And then very good. Granted, against largely role players. So we will see if he can find his rhythm a little bit. Hardaway started strong, faded kind of middling, and now he's had a good game as well. So if you get him and his 40% mark from three this year on, I think, like seven attempts a game, then you're in good position. This offense, when you can really spread the floor and let Luka and KP do their things, you're in great shape. What this offense is missing when it was at its peak, probably, while KP has stepped up since Dwight Powell went out with the Achilles injury, the big difference for Dallas I think in terms of the lethality of their offense was when you did have, you know, I know he's a, a very polarizing name in the Mavericks fan base. Dwight Powell is an elite rim roller was fantastic for the Mavericks. His lob threat he presented really put strain on opposing defenses. And you even had uh, Steve Kerr talking about that um, during the season as well. When they had that element, they were nearly impossible to guard. KP is not an elite lob threat. He can certainly throw down some dunks and he can slash and you can set up ways, uh, set up nice plays in other ways, like you saw a couple different times with regard to the Bucks game, a couple times where he, you know, slashed down and Luca gave him just easy layoffs for facials he was delivering. But it's a little bit of a different element there. So that's one area that the Mavericks offense has had to kind of evolve. And while they've still continued to be a very efficient offense, without that element really cooking when the outside shot isn't working with enough guys on the team, it does put strain on you to really compete and win. So something to keep in mind there. I think Rick Carlisle has continued to tinker with things and we'll see how he responds moving forward. I also had him on my X Factor list and he's definitely had some head scratching moments in the bubble thus far. Overall, I st still tend to think that he's going to be a difference maker for this team. Because once you get down into a seven game series, granted if it's the Clippers, you might just have nothing you can do in that regard because it's such a terrible matchup. But if you get into the seven game playoff series, typically he finds some things out and we know that he will empty his bag of tricks and throw everything he's got at them to at least make his team competitive. So we'll see there, but uh, anything else? Is there anything else I want to run through here? This is from Tim Cato on uh, Twitter. He pointed out what I said earlier. Dallas took only 24 threes in the game while sitting their stars. They average more than 42 a game. So yeah, basically close to half as many attempts as usual. But it's also a reminder of how many good looks Luka and KP generate for the team. When you don't have the two of them out there, it leads to a bit of a difference. So we'll see how this can uh, shake out here. But I don't think there's a whole lot more that needs calling out here. I guess I can run through this. Dallas shot 56% compared to 48% for the Jazz. From three, they did shoot 50%, but made 12 compared to 21. So I would take the Jazz as 46% there, obviously. Free throw line, Dallas again, 14 of 16. In fact, both misses oddly came at the hands of, let's see, who was it? I'm trying to remember who it was that went to the line and missed both free throw attempts. It was DeLon Wright. That's right, DeLon Wright in this game. Had 19 minutes, so he got good burn. But uh, three steals 
found ways to contribute in other ways, but he was the only guy to miss both free throws, missed both on a single trip. Uh, turnovers, Dallas very good again, only 8 compared to 12 for the Jazz. Assist about even, Dallas with the slight edge, 29-28. to 28. Rebounds, Utah wins the rebound battle, 38-34, and kills Dallas on the offensive glass, 11-4. to 4. Utah also wins in the category of blocks. Dallas gets six steals compared to five. And Dallas commits slightly more fouls, 23 versus 19. But not a whole lot else to write home about. This is a, this is a game that was supposed to be more of a moral victory, and instead you found extra, extra on the side there. So we'll see what they can do. But that's going to do it for my time for this video, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like this video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and remember, every legend was once a prospect.